Okay, <clears throat> let's begin. The homework assignment that I gave you on Tuesday, I'll collect that on next Tuesday. And we're going to talk a little bit about the, um, the handout problem. I've already given you a little bit of a guide on solving the, um, the three pipe problem. But we'll talk about the handout problem. And then uh, next Tuesday, bring your computer because the uh, procedure I teach you in class today, we're going to turn into an Excel spreadsheet to make it a little bit easier to solve the Hardy Cross method, which is the subject of today's lecture. Any question about these announcements? <clears throat> okay. Well, here's that homework tip. Uh, this is one of the problems that you have due on Tuesday. And um, so you've got two reservoirs. And by the way, I made a couple of adjustments to the slide that I've previously given you. One of the adjustments, for example, is these red arrows. <coughs> previously, the slide didn't have the red arrows. So you may want to draw those on there. Um, what we know about this is there is a system of flow coming in at junction C. We know the flow rate is 0.2 cubic meters per second that comes in. But we don't know how much goes through pipe AC and how much goes through pipe BC. And in fact, we don't even know what direction the flow is going. It's possible, for example, that flow could be coming out of the reservoir and towards junction C. And if that was true, that would mean that the flow that comes in at the junction and the flow from AC all would need to go down through pipe BC. So um, the tools that we're going to use in solving this problem are continuity equation because at each junction, the flow in has to equal the flow out. And the other tool that you're going to use is this energy loss equation. This is the same as that complicated, spooky, rearranged energy equation that I showed you the nodal method last time in class, except for that we've replaced the FL divided by 2GA squared D by just this variable R. So in the problem, uh, you'll have all the information you need except for the F value to calculate R. What would you do if you have a case where you um, don't know exactly what the flow rate is, but you have to put F into this formula. Well, how should you respond to that? You don't know what the, the flow rate is, so you can't calculate the velocity. So you can't calculate, calculate the Reynolds number, so you can't calculate F. But you have to solve the problem anyway. You can't just write, don't know the velocity, can't find F. Assume a value, OK. So you could just pick a value. We can do a little bit better than that, right? The shortcut method. What's that called? The assumption. The fully turbulent flow assumption, right. So in this problem, you're going to have to start off by making the fully turbulent flow assumption. You'll know the pipe diameter. You'll know the relative roughness, which has a variable k sub s or the variable epsilon. They're uh, interchangeable, different texts use different variables. But one of your starting point, points will be to calculate an R for the pipe, where R is a function of its length, its diameter, and the F value. Once you've done that, you just have to assume some flow. Not only are you going to have to guess the F value, you're going to have to guess what direction the flow is going, because we don't know. So maybe say, for example, all right, I'm going to assume that some of the flow goes through CA from C towards A, and some of the flow goes from C towards B. So you just you make a guess that the flow is going away from this junction, and you're just focusing on one junction at a time. You don't have to solve the whole system all at once. You focus on just junction C to begin with. Uh, so Continuity has to be satisfied. You're going to uh, assume maybe that uh, 0.1 goes this way and 0.1 goes that way, maybe. Um, what we do know is the head at C in terms of this unknown flow rate. So you could say, now remember here is the nodal equation. It's just the energy equation. You could say that the head at C, if the water is going 
because of your guess, you assume that water is going from C towards A. If that's your guess, just as a starting point, then that makes this location 1, meaning upstream, and then that would mean this is location 2, meaning downstream. Just because you've assumed a flow direction and our convention is water goes from 1 towards 2. Okay. So the head at C is going to be bigger than the head at A. So that'll be um, the head at A is the head at C minus the losses. That's what this equation says is you can find the head downstream. It's however much head there was upstream minus the losses. Now this is assuming flow goes from C towards A. Maybe that's right, maybe it's not. Frankly, I don't even remember on the answer which way the flows go. I certainly don't remember what the flow rates are, but um, we can do a similar thing from B and C. We could say that the uh, the head at, let's see, how are we going to do this? The head at, if the water is going, we assumed it was going from C towards B, just as a, as a starting point. So we're going to have the head at C is bigger, so it'll be HB, good, is HC minus the losses. And the flow rate that we were talking about here was the flow rate from A to C. And the flow rate we're talking about here is the flow rate B between B and C. So those are two different flow rates. So we've applied this idea that head decreases in the direction of flow. That we made some guess in flow direction and as a consequence of that guess we can write the head at C in terms of where we know the flow direction. Flow decreases, a head decreases in the direction of flow. Um, later on, when we solve all this, if our guess was wrong, your answer will either give you an imaginary number or it'll give you a negative flow rate. And that's when you'll know, oh, one of my guesses must have been wrong. I have to try a different flow direction, run through the calculations again and see if I'm getting a real positive solution. Um, <coughs> all right. We're not to that part yet. So we know the head at B because it's connected to the reservoir. We know that the head at B is 20 meters. And we know that the head of A, since it's just immediately adjacent to that junction, uh, and the reservoir are connected to each other with a very short piece of pipe, the head at A is 25 meters. So we can substitute those known values in where we know it. So we can say that uh, we can rearrange this in terms of the head at C. So it's the head at C is head at A plus R Q A C squared. Um, and then, so that's rearranging this in terms of HC. We can rearrange this in terms of HC. HC is HB plus RQBC squared. So we've got both of these in terms of HC. Who wants to guess what the next step's going to be? What's that? Set them equal. Very good. You saw it. It helps that they're both on the left side of the equation. So what we can do is say HA plus RQAC squared is equal to HB plus RQBC uh, squared. So we set those two equal to each other. HA and HB, those are known values. So now 
the R's have been calculated based on the pipe characteristics. So R is known, HA and HB is known. Now we know the flow rates in terms of each other. We know um, QAC, some it'll be something you know like 500 QAC squared is equal to 295 QBC squared. Now it's not the real numbers. I'm just saying as an example what it'll look like. Um, those will be the R values and then it would be HA is 25 and HB is 20 so it would be plus 5. So you'd have one equation that looks like this and continuity equation we know is that QAC plus QBC is equal to 0 0.2. And there's our second equation. So you can write QAC in terms of QBC and solve for both of the flow rates now. But the trick is, number one, you may get that you've got some negative flow rate. Like when you, you solve it, it would say QBC is negative 0.1 cubic meters per second. And so if you get a negative flow rate, that means just one of your flow direction assumptions is wrong. So change one of them, go through this again, and see if now you get a real positive solution. Okay? Now, anytime we use the fully turbulent flow assumption, we have to check it and then iterate. So you'll solve for this junction, and all we've solved so far is just junction C. So you know the, a preliminary guess of the flow rate through AC and a preliminary guess through pipe BC. So if you've got the flow rates, you can find the velocities, which means that you can find a real F value by the Jane equation. So you'll have to see how is your real F value compared to the guess one from fully turbulent. And uh, if I remember correctly, the fully turbulent does not get you within 1%. So you'll have to do another iteration with the updated F value. So you'll have a different F value. It'll change your R a little bit. Um, so I solved this one on paper. And it's a little bit lots of writing. All right. You can calculate the R values on a spreadsheet if you want. It saves a little bit of time, not a ton. So, any questions about how to solve this one? It's a logic problem, really. It's a logic problem. You just have to say, uh, if, you know, what's going on at a junction? So you solve for that junction, and then once you've found out what's happening at that junction, you do the same procedure at D, where you'll say, I don't know the head at D absolutely yet, but you know that the head at D is the head at B plus or minus the losses, depending on what flow direction you assume. And then the last thing you do, once you know the flow rate in each pipe, is you have to find out how much flow is coming out of or into the reservoir. Because you can do the flow balance at A, and you will have, when you are analyzing this junction, you'll find out what the flow rate is. And so you'll find out this pipe flow rate, you'll find out this pipe flow rate, and it won't be equal to each other, which means some of the water is coming out of the reservoir. And uh, some water is going into this reservoir, so you need to know what are, what are those quantities. All right. So I'd encourage you to get an early start on that one, just so that if you find it tricky, you can check with a classmate, you know, the answer that you get, or you can come see me, and I'm happy to... Uh, let you know if your flow rates are correct. That's right. You assume that the, it's a constant head reservoir regardless of the, the flow going in and out. Good question, yeah. Any other questions before we move on? All right. We'll enjoy it. It's a lovely question. It has uh, bedeviled students since the beginning of time. <coughs> well, today we're going to talk about something that's known as the Hardy-Cross method, and it's used for solving really complicated flow networks 
that we couldn't um, apply the nodal method to. I mean, this network will seem complicated enough, and it only has one loop. Think about if you were having to solve a network with lots of loops and pipes going everywhere like this. In a grid situation, um, you know, lots of municipal areas have streets laid out on a grid, and so pipe networks will also, uh, often take a similar pattern as the streets that they're buried underneath. Um, so if you've got water going in at one pipe and coming out, through multiple uh, pipes, the water has lots of different flow paths that it can take. And what do you suppose dictates whether the water would all go through this pipe here and then down and over? You know, if water has so many different routes to go towards the outlet, why will it choose one versus another? Or a certain amount going through one pipe and a, a little bit less going through a different pipe? It's about resistances. And so the flow rate, there will be different flow rates in each pipe, but basically the, uh, each pathway from the inlet to the outlet will have the same head loss, regardless of the route. Once the system is in equilibrium, whether, you know, there will maybe be a, a trickle of water going this long route towards the exit. And there would maybe be a little more going this way. But each one of the paths, regardless of which path you take, will give you the same head loss. So the method that we apply takes that into account. It's in the background. You won't necessarily know it's doing this, but this method will be automatically balancing the energy equation, trying to make sure that all of the pipes in the network are experiencing the same head loss. And it does that through a series of iterations. And there's a couple of different ways to do it. Uh, today, I'm going to teach you the hand method because you have to know how the hand method works before you can set it up in a spreadsheet. Uh, so that's why next uh, Tuesday is going to be a computer day, is we're going to set it up on a spreadsheet next time. It's a little bit of effort to set it up, but once it's set up, the iterations are just that copy-paste, copy-paste thing, even easier than it was last time we did it. The other thing is that WaterGems uses this method. And later in the semester, when you're doing your design project, then you'll come back to the Hardy-Cross method because it's built into water gems, and that's how it finds the pressure at each of the junctions. And so you'll actually get some experience with all three of these methods. Uh, so Hardy-Cross method is built into all of the hydraulic design packages. And uh, this idea of calculating an R value has already been introduced, but one of the other things I have to mention is that there's an exponent, a uh, flow rate squared, when you're using the Darcy-Wiesbach equation. In the handout I'm going to give you today, it mentions that if you're using the uh, Hayes and Williams equation, then n is 1.85. Most of the time, Darcy-Wiesbach would be better for our purposes. We get improved accuracy, and, uh, th but that is one adjustment you have to be aware of. R can be calculated based on the pipe characteristics, but remember that since F is constantly changing with flow rate, as we are iterating, we have to go back and calculate a new R value for each set of iterations that we do. And that's something I'll come back to remind you about. Here's the formula for R. It's the F value, the pipe length, uh, and then 2G A squared divided by D. And A squared is because we're going to have Q squared. And you'll remember that the normal Darcy-Wiesbach equation says that head loss due to pipe friction is FLV squared divided by D2G. And that's the same as FLQ squared divided by D2G A squared, since V is Q divided by A. So that's why the R value here has Q, uh, A squared in the denominator. It's because when we apply R times Q squared, it's the Darcy-Wiesbach equation. Okay, so just to give you some example calculating R, um, use the parameters that are listed there. We know uh, a concrete pipe which has a certain case of S value 
It's 85 meters long. The flow rate's given, so you can actually use the full Jane equation on this one. You're not going to have to assume the fully turbulent flow assumption. Calculate the R value for that. And while you're doing that, I'll hand back the quizzes that we had last time in class. All right. We know the flow rate, the diameter. With the diameter, we get the cross-sectional area. And then, since we know the flow rate and the area, we can find the velocity. From the velocity, the diameter, and the kinematic viscosity. And since we've got SI units here, we use 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second for the kinematic viscosity. Uh, then that's where we get the Reynolds number. So we use the full version of the Jane equation, or if you're really Old school, you pull out the Colebrook equation and you iterate and all that stuff, but you get an F value, 0 0.0242, um, and from there it's just substituting everything to get the R value of 0 0.7103. Now, the R values themselves don't really mean anything unless you're comparing R values to other pipes in a network. And when you do that, if you had a network like <coughs> this, if you had R values for each of those pipes, then you can sort of get an idea of where the flow is probably going to go. And um, so a high R value means lots of resistance. So more flow is going to go through the low R values. Because remember, the higher the F or the higher the length, the less likely flow is to, to go through those. Or the things that make it easier for flow is a big diameter, and that's in the denominator. So a low R value, if we had like R is 10 for this pipe, but R is 2 for this one, it means that more flow is going to go through this pipe than through the other one. Brandon, did you have a question? Mm, yeah, I did. I did in my calculations, but I didn't write it there. Thanks for noticing. Yeah, that's A squared. Yeah, they have units. I think in the slide I say it's, what, second squared meters to the fifth. <coughs> yeah, but <coughs> since we're putting it into the uh, Darcy-Wiesbach equation, which is not dimensionally homogeneous, in the end what we're trying to get is uh, head loss in terms of meters when we put it into this equation. So, you know, if you have flow rate squared, it's going to be cubic meters per second squared. We just need whatever the units to be of R to turn it out so that in the end when we multiply those two things together, we get head loss, which is meters. All right, so here's the procedure. Calculating R, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, let me give you the handout. Many years ago, I used just an awful textbook for hydraulics. I won't mention it because I don't want to hurt the author's feeling, and I'm sure he's listening to this right now. Uh, but it, oh, it was just the worst. I felt so bad for the students. And um, it took me the whole afternoon one day, but I went through this poorly written textbook and came up with these procedures. And. Um, so you are the beneficiary of me translating that poor explanation so that you know how to do the Hardy-Cross method. Um, now, I used this right here. Mm -hmm. I assume this went to zero. And it doesn't, though, because we, we know the Reynolds number. We only use this when okay. we don't know the flow rate. Okay. Yeah. Since we did know the flow rate, we could calculate the Reynolds number. All right. All right. <coughs> We call it the R value. R, I, I guess, means resistance, maybe. You can call it whatever you want. Think of a really good name and let me know. Yes. Uh-huh. That's right. Does everyone have a copy of the handout? All right. 
So here we have a network. And just for purposes of simplicity, in this network, um, we're going to assume that R is fixed. In reality, when we, when we do our spreadsheet day next Tuesday, we're going to calculate a new R value every time we get a better guess of the flow rate. But just because we're focusing on the process today and not specific calculations necessarily, I didn't want to complicate things by saying that R changes. Um, just by looking at it, we can tell that there are two loops. And uh, the first thing that we have to do is, you know, figure out how many loops there are. Here there's two. And this may seem silly, but one of the hardest parts of this method for students to make sense of is the initial flow balance. And so we'll spend some time on that. Because when you first look at it, it's not immediately clear um, how to do that initial flow balance. Okay, so we've got a network that looks like this. And uh, there's a pipe between these two junctions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this junction 1, 2, 3, and 4 flow goes into 4, and it goes out of each of the other junctions. Okay, and we know the flow rate's in and out, that it's 100 going into 4, 30 coming out of 3, 50 coming out of 2, and 20 going out of 1. Do we have balance so far? Does n equals out at this point? Because if it doesn't, we're in trouble. So far, I think we're all right, because 20 plus 50 is 70, plus another 30. So it's 100 flowing out and 100 flowing in. So, so far, continuity is OK. We've got two loops. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this loop 1. I'm going to call this loop 2. It doesn't matter. We could have switched those names. Um, Next thing it says in step two is select a positive flow direction. What that means is you have to say either clockwise or positive, clockwise flow is positive, or counterclockwise. I'm going to say that clockwise flow is positive. And so what that means is that any time water is going in the same direction as my assumption, I'm going to give that a positive flow rate value in the calculation. So if water was going this way, then I'd say the flow in pipe 1, 2 is positive because it's going in the same direction as clockwise. But if flow was going the other direction, if it was going to the left, then you see that my clockwise flow is, is uh, is against the flow that this assumption is. So then that would be a negative flow. All right, fair enough, easy. Um, <clears throat> let's see, define your loops, assign a guess flow rate. Okay, so step five, assign a guess flow rate. <clears throat> I'd like everyone, just to get some practice, um, and it's on the back of the handout I've just given you. On the back of the handout I've just given you, Set up a flow balance, a guess flow rate in each pipe. And the uh, requirement is, is that if you go to any junction, the flow in and the flow out of that junction has to match. All right? So everyone's guess will be a little bit different, but without ever having tried it before, I'd like you to give it a shot. You know, guess a flow rate in each pipe so that at each junction it, there is balance. <clears throat> and All right, so let's just begin. There's no wrong answer when you do this. The only wrong answer is if continuity equation doesn't, uh, isn't satisfied. So what I'm going to guess is, and I'm just doing this on the fly. I don't have any notes with me. So I'm going to assume that 1 goes there, 99 goes that way, 
Okay, so now I am at this junction. Um, before I can do this junction, I've got like two unknowns. I, I don't know what's happening in that pipe or in that pipe. So I'm going to move to another junction. Here it's easier because I know that 50 is going out, so 50 has to go in. So I'm going to assume that I've got oh, 7 going that way, which means that it has to be 43 that way. And those are pretty weird numbers, right? And I'm doing it that way intentionally just to prove that as long as continuity is satisfied at each junction, it's all going to work out. So now I'll, let me go back to junction 1. I've got 99 going in here, and I've got 27 going out between the outflow and pipe 1, 2. So that means I have to have a little bit more flow going out. So it's got to be that way, and how much... And 99 minus 27, that is 72, right? Okay, so 72 is going that way. Now, here's the fingers crossed moment. I look at junction 3. Does it all balance? I've got 1 plus 72 going in, that's 73. And I've got 30 going out and 43 going out, and that's 73. It's miraculous. So continuity is satisfied at each junction. Okay, I'm going to erase that, and I'd like you to take another crack, because if experience is any judge, most of you probably were like, I have no idea how to do it. Now that you've seen it, try again. And don't use the same numbers that I used. Use something else. All right? saying you, you don't trust your classmate, I suppose. All right, so we've got our R values. Maybe if you were doing the full method, you would have had to calculate them. In the first iteration, you would have done it with the fully turbulent flow assumption. You've got a guess flow rate. Now we're going to start filling in the table. All right? So for the network that's here, I'm going to have one column that's called the iteration column. Iteration, there's going to be the loop indicator, pipe name, the n value, r, q, r times q times the absolute value of q, n times r times absolute value of q, delta q, and then corrected q. All right. So let's start off, we're in iteration one, and we have loop one. Loop one is um, the bottom one, right? Yeah, it's the bottom one. Okay, so I've got three pipes in that network. I've got pipe one, four, I've got pipe one, three, and pipe three, four. Those are my three pipes. Now N is going to be two for the whole problem. It's always going to be two because I'm using the Darcy-Wiesbach equation. If I was using the Hazen-Williams friction loss formula, then N would be 1.85. Okay, now we'll put the R values for the pipes. We get that from just the drawing, or the R values would be from the Jane equation multiplied by all the other factors. So in this case, it's just given. It's 6 for pipe 1, 4. 3 for pipe 1, 3, and 5 for pipe 3, 4. Okay? Now, the rest of the example is going to be based on my flow assumptions. So, I don't know, put another set of flow assumptions on yours because I said that the flow is uh, pipe 1, 4. I'm saying is, all right, here's pipe 1, 4. It's 50 as my initial guess, and I'm sending 50 that way as well. My initial guess is that the flow is 15 through that one. And then I'm saying my balance here is uh, 15 and 35. So pipe 1, 2, I'm having 
15 and 35. So in order for the rest of the example to make sense, you should write this down as the initial guess. And continuity, it looks like, is satisfied. Yes. All right. Okay, so that is where <coughs> that's where these flow rate values are going to come from that I'm writing here. Pipe 1, 4, 50. Pipe 1, 3, 15. And pipe 3, 4. What should I write for pipe 3, 4? Negative 50. Why negative? Because, yeah, it's going against my flow assumption. My flow assumption is that clockwise is positive, but it's going against that. So that's why I put the negative value there for pipe 3, 4. Okay, now I'm going to multiply R times Q times the absolute value of Q. If you're really quick with a calculator, you can uh, follow along with me. But I'm just going to write the numbers because what, what I'm trying to get you to focus on uh, today is like the form of the solution. Like, what things you're adding together, what things you're multiplying together, and so on. So it's 15,000 if you do N, uh, yeah, let's see, R times Q times the absolute value of Q. 15,675 for pipe 1, 3, and negative 12,500. So you'll notice that having one of the Qs ab outside the absolute value and one of them inside means that we retain a sign there if it's a negative flow rate. If we had just squared Q, then we wouldn't be able to see that negative value. And it's important. We need to have that in order to get this uh, resistance balance thing to work out. So we'll do a similar N times R times the absolute value of Q for this next column. And it's 690 and 500. <coughs> so now what I need to do is add up these three numbers. So 15,000 plus 675 minus 12,500. So the sum of that is 3,175. And then I need to add up these three values, 600, 90, and 500. So from that I get 1,190. easy enough. This delta Q is um, the formula that's shown right here. It's the negative of the sum of RQ absolute value of Q divided by the sum of NR absolute value of Q. So it is the negative of this 3175 divided by 1190. So negative 3175 divided by 1190. My correction, delta Q, is going to be negative 2.668. Now, I've just done the calculations there so you can see what they are, but I need to make room for other iterations, so I'm going to erase that. I'm just going to put over here negative 2.668, and I'm going to write it three times. Negative 2.668, negative 2.668. Okay, so I'll erase that. And you'll remember where it came from. You'll remember that it's the negative of this divided by that. All right, so any questions up to this point? Take a quick breather. All right. Corrected Q is just your original guess plus the delta Q. So 50 plus negative 2.668 gives me 47.332. 15 plus negative 2.668 gives me 12.332. And then negative 50 plus negative 2.668 gives me negative 52.668. These corrected Qs, 
it's a better guess of the actual flow rate through those pipes. I had my initial guesses and now I'm a little bit closer to the truth. Okay, now we're going to look at loop two. We're still in the first iteration though. So loop two. I've got three pipes in loop two. I've got pipe one, two. I've got pipe two, three and pipe one, three. All right, n is always going to be two. And then the r values, I'll just look off of the figure to get these r values. It's one for pipe one, two, two for pipe two, three, and three for pipe one, three. As a reminder, if you're doing this full-fledged, r values are calculated rather than just constant. Okay, now I have to go back to my uh, drawing here and my original flow balance and I had 15 for pipe 1, 2. What should I write for pipe 2, 3? Negative 35. All right, good. Now here's the tricky part. And 100% uh, of you will make this mistake at least once when we're setting it up on a spreadsheet. Everyone does all the time, including me, because it's just hard to remember sometimes. So here it is. Maybe you can be the one who gets away, the one who doesn't make this mistake. If you listen close enough, but everyone's going to make this mistake. All right. What flow rate should I put for pipe 1-3? What do you think? Why is he asking you like it's important or something? What flow rate do you think? Okay. Let's see. It's not that, uh, let's see. Here it is, pipe one, three. It's in both loops. So now we're in loop two. So the sign convention depends on which perspective you're in. So we're in loop two. So I should say it's going against 15. So negative 15 is what I would write, except that I have a better guess. So this is like a double confusing one. It's confusing because when I'm in loop one, I call that a positive flow. But now that I'm looking at it from the perspective of loop two, it's a negative flow. So that's the first complication. And the second complication is I don't need that old lousy guess of 15. Here, I've got a better new and improved guess from my first loop of 12.332, so none of you would have guessed this, right? Negative 12.332 is actually what I'm going to write in there for the flow rate. Now, at this point, continuity isn't satisfied in these intermediate steps. It has to be satisfied at the beginning, and at the very end, it'll be satisfied. But don't worry, like if you were to add it all up at this point, it might be that some of the junctions don't have a balanced flow rate. Well, don't worry. This equation is going to handle that. It's going to balance not only the flow rates, but it's also going to balance the energy losses so that everything works out if you apply this process over and over again. Both of the things uh, will converge. Okay, so is anyone still mystified where this flow rate came from? The fact that it's negative and the fact that it's not 15, which I had over there in my drawing? All right, so you can see why it's a common mistake, right? All right, so that's a good question. Uh, no, the solution won't converge. Yeah, it, it'll sometimes it'll get close, but d depending on what the numbers are, sometimes it just won't converge. So it's like it's like a confusing thing. When I first was doing this, uh, teaching this, I thought it wasn't important that it would. It was just more iterations. But it turns out there are some cases where it simply, it'll never converge. And you'll always, you'll do like 30 cut pastes and it still won't quite be where it needs to be. I'm glad you asked that. That's right. Yeah. The, like the loop perspective is still, you're always, uh, it needs to be the opposite of the value from the previous loop. You know, so here, when I was in the perspective of loop one, it was positive 12.33. Now I've changed the loop, I'm calling it negative 12.33. Okay, now we do the boring stuff. R times Q times absolute value of Q. So, I'm going to make myself a little bit of room here. That's 
Okay, 225, negative 2450, and negative 456. Because I'm doing R times Q times absolute value of Q. Now I'll do N times R times absolute value of Q and get 30, 140, and 74. Okay, and I need to do the sum thing where I, I add up those three values together and I get negative 2681. And then over here, I add it up and the value is 244. So what's my delta Q? Here's another pretty common mistake. The delta Q. It's going to be a positive number. Why is it going to be a positive number? Because the negative is built into the formula. Good. Always remember that. So it is going to be, in this case, 10.989. 10.989. 10 10.989. That seems repetitive. Why didn't I just write it one time and kind of remember? It's because when we set this up as a spreadsheet, in order to get the cut and paste to work, you actually have to type the formula in three times. I'll show you that on Tuesday, but just to get in the habit, I'm going to write it three times. And then the corrected Q is the, the most recent guess of the Q, so 15 uh, plus 10.989, so that gives me 25.989. I'll have negative 35 plus 10.989, so that gives me negative 24.01. And then negative 12.332 plus 10.989. I've got negative 1.343. All right. We're on track. Everything's looking good so far. Any questions? Charles can't wait to see where this is going. <laughs> Wait no longer. Iteration two. We're back to loop one. All right. Let me draw this line just to kind of keep everything separated. Okay. Now this is where if you're working in Excel, you can start to save yourself some time because you don't have to type in one, four, one, three, three, four. You can just select the cell, copy, paste. So we've got one, four. 1, 3, 3, 4, and then later on when I'm doing loop 2, I'm going to have 1, 2, 2, 3, and 1, 3. The end is always going to be 2, 2, 2 for each of them. I can write the R values. Alright, so I'm just going to write down the R values, but if you're doing this in a spreadsheet, you would calculate a new R value based on this updated flow rate, the corrected Q, just to let you know how things are going to be different when we get serious about it on Tuesday. But for now, it's going to be 6, 3, 5, 1, 2, 3. All right. Flow rates. OK, so we're at a fork in the road. We have to write our flow rates. What's the reasonable thing to do? Is the reasonable thing for me to do to go back over here and say, all right, pipe one, pipe one four. Pipe one four is a 50, and that's a positive 50. Pipe three four is a negative 50. And why would, that would be like starting over having learned nothing. Yeah. You don't want to just use your original flow rates. You want to use always the most updated recent flow rate data that you've got. So pipe 1.4, that's going to be from over here. So if I was typing in Excel, I'd say equals, look over here at this cell. So it's going, you don't have to type the value in necessarily in Excel. You just make it a relative reference. 47.332, 1.343. 
Now hold on a second. I thought over here we had 12.332. What did I just do in writing 1.343? It's from the most recent version of pipe 1.3. So it was in loop 2 down here. I've got a better guess. This is a better guess than that was. And then I changed the sign of it. I flipped it because when you go from loop to loop, you change whether it's a positive or a negative. All right, so equals negative whatever's in that cell. So 1.343 and negative 52.668. Okay, and then I do these calculation things. R times Q times absolute value of Q. So that gives me 13,442, 5.4, and negative 13,869. And then I do N times R times absolute value of Q, and I get 568.8. And 527. Add them all up. The first column, the sum of those is negative 422. The other is 10, oh, nope, 1102. And so then the correction factor is going to be the negative of 422 divided negative of negative 422 divided by 1102. So the correction factor is going to be 0 0.383 for all of them. 383, 0 0.383. Now, before I actually do that correction, I want to stop and appreciate the fact that my delta Q is getting smaller. That's a good sign. The fact that in the first iteration, the magnitude of my delta Q was 2.8 basically 2.7. Now it's down to correcting 0.4. So that's definitely headed towards convergence. If your delta Q's are getting bigger, you've got a, a math error somewhere. Or continuity didn't balance. There's so many places that you can make a mistake on this process. That's why it's really good to computerize it when you can. Um, but I like the fact that it's smaller than it used to be, the correction, because we want that delta Q eventually to go to zero, meaning that all of the pipes have a balance in flow rate and an equilibrium in energy losses through all of the routes. Okay, so I have new updated flow rates, 47.715, 1.72, 1.73, 1.75, 1.75, 1.75. Let's just do one other thing. Let's figure out what flow rates should we put for pipe 1, 2, 2, 3, and 1, 3. Okay, so pipe 1, 3, I'm going to look. Where's my most recent flow rate? Here it is. So I'll use 25.989. For pipe 2, 3, it is negative 24.01. And pipe 1-3, that's the tricky one, remember, because it's the common pipe. I don't just use this value. I use that one. So negative 1.726. All right, then we do all the calculations, blah, blah, blah. As many times as it takes for delta Q to get down to zero or pretty close. In this case, if we, do, if we did four iterations, then we'd be exactly where we needed to be. So when we get together on Tuesday, we're going to solve, you're going to watch me solve this one on Excel. And it's going to be like, you're going to be so anxious because you're going to want to start doing it yourself. But you're just going to have to watch me solve this one on Excel. But then I'll turn you loose on a really ugly loop. And uh, we'll go through that together. All right? So, Good luck on the homework. Let me know if you have any questions as you go through it. And uh, have a great weekend.